If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. We got in contact with uh, Tommy uh, because he was mentioned by Mark Weinstein when we had him on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. And um, what you're about to hear is an interview with a gentleman who started a company. It's brand new. And the aim of the company is to get people to structure uh, time away from their phones, which sounds funny, but this guy's getting its business is growing because people see a need for it. It's really, really interesting. And he's uh, he's got a, he's a really interesting guy too. He's uh, when I first came across um, his Instagram and his page, I started looking into him. I, I listened to one of his interviews. Um, what I didn't find out till way later, after I dug through all stuff, was he's a Duke University grad and he's got a background in neuroscience, mm-hmm. and he's got a, a killer background in Hollywood. I mean, he actually literally worked for Spielberg and yeah. DreamWorks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Jealous. So he's got a he's got some serious connections. He's also uh, I think was hearing things earlier than a lot of people. Like, uh, and mm-hmm. I just felt the same way I felt when I first read the book. That I talk a million times about that everyone teases me about a couple of years ago. That thing just it sent me down this this rabbit hole of oh my god, like what do we have coming ahead of us? And I really believe uh, that we are heading this way. And it was only a matter of time before other people started to recognize it and see it, and then somebody creates some sort of a movement to to counter it, right? Yeah, I like what he's doing. I like that it's about creating kind of boundaries and and figuring out how to navigate um, through all these these new technology, uh, you know, pitfalls that we find ourselves in. And it's the thing is, it's it's addictive, but you don't have to feel ashamed that you're being addicted. Uh, because that's really what's engineered into these phones. And I just like that he hasn't, the message isn't abandon your phone. It's, uh, you know, how do we now Mm -hmm. implement good practices? Yeah. Total health and wellness today includes a practice that involves becoming more active. It includes a practice around understanding when it's appropriate to eat certain foods and when you should eat other foods and how to be healthy around that. It's also currently in modern times uh, about developing a practice with your technology. And this is just a reality. It's, it's digital wellness is how Tommy talks about it. And we couldn't agree more. And so he talks all about that in this episode. And he talks about what his company is doing and then the app that they're creating that's going to help people create those, uh, those practices to develop a better sense of digital wellness. Now, uh, you can find Tommy. His last name is Sobel. Um, his the website is go brick now g o b r i c k n o w dot com, and then the Instagram page is at go brick now. Uh, it's because uh, the company uh, is called Brick, and it talks about turning your phone off, putting it on airplane mode, structured throughout the day, literally creating, uh, turning it into a brick, if you will. Um, before we get into the interview, though, I do want to remind everybody that Maps Aesthetic is 50% off all month long. This is one of our most popular programs. It is the bodybuilder-focused, bikini competitor-focused type program. So if you're into sculpting and shaping your body, um, if your main goal for working out is the aesthetics of your body, this is the program for you. Half off, just go to mapsfitnessproducts.com, use the code BLACK50, B-L-A-C-K-5-0, for the 50% off discount. Um, and that's it. So without any further ado, here we are talking to Tommy Sobel of Brick. Two or three years ago, I had read um, a book, Irresistible, and these guys were just teasing the shit out of me because- Not because the book, <laughs> we thought the book wasn't good, yeah. just because he mentioned it. He just it. said it like all the time. Uh-huh. Yeah, time I just kept- we just, I, It was predictable. I just kept bringing it up. And Are you familiar with Adam Atler's Irresistible? Uh, I know Adam Atler. I haven't read it now. Yeah, Irresistible no. is a, a a really good read. Um, oh, I was thinking of Predictably Irrational. That's where. Oh, okay. Got it. Different. So I, I read that like two maybe over two years now, um, and the it was just it it really impacted me because here we were right in the middle of building this social media business and using podcasting, YouTube, Instagram as a platform. And the the story the storyline is just super compelling. They they make they draw parallels to uh, tech and cocaine, you know, mm. and, and the addict the addictiveness and and the, and the even scarier part that they try and, and talk about is that 
you know, with when someone's a drug addict, it's it's pretty obvious, you know, because you you see all these these signs and and we kind of shame that person. But we're in the middle of glorifying tech. We're mm-hmm. not shaming you because you're using your phone or you're on the computer or you're doing these things. So their argument or his argument is the how scary it is because of that. Like not only is it as addictive as some of these other things they're talking about, mm. but then in addition to that, it's also something that we actually celebrate versus something that we would shame you for. And so they, they be, in turn can be even more dangerous because of that. Yeah, yeah. Tommy, I found your, I think you should go over your background a little bit for the audience before we get into the the discussion that Adam's starting because I found it fascinating. I found your background fascinating. I know you have a background in neuroscience and kind of how you came to what you're doing I thought was pretty interesting. So if you don't mind giving kind of a short synopsis of. Yeah, definitely. So we are recording. We are. (laughs) It's happening. That's how we roll. Yeah, so I grew up in LA. I grew up trying to be an actor basically in LA. My dad was in the film industry and uh, I wanted to be in movies. And uh, as I grew up, nothing really worked out. And so I got into a really good college. I got into Duke and and was like, you know what? I'm going to become a doctor as a backup in case the film world didn't work out. I was very interested in the brain and, and behavior. And I came out of that pre-med and ended up um, with a focus in neuroscience. And basically was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. I I was working days as a production assistant at this film production company run by Kathy Kennedy and Frank Marshall, who are Steven Spielberg's producers. And then at night, I was working on this long gestating project at UCLA, uh, this neuroscience project, and then was going from there to like DJ and promote out in Hollywood. And then on the weekends, I was like, uh, producing and directing music videos. So I was, I was basically, I felt like this octopus trying to experientially figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And at around the same time that this neuroscience project got published, um, I got offered this job to be Steven Spielberg's assistant, um, pretty serendipitously. And so I realized that I love science, but I love the results of science. I don't love conducting the Mm. scientific research. And with this opportunity, I was going to go full on into film and uh, basically try to make science cool through this premium storytelling. Oh, interesting. Kind Mm. of in like a Michael Crichton type way where Mm. he'll take this idea of bringing extinct species back to life and wrap it in this broad thriller, get this guy like Steven Spielberg to direct it, and then people will come and watch it because of their interest in kind of an adventure thriller, but then might come out of it being more interested in how chromosomes work or DNA or something. Oh, oh pop culture's done that for a long time. Like Carl yeah. Sagan was responsible right. for thousands of kids you know, wanting to learn yeah. astrophysics. Yeah, exactly. So how can, how can we... How can we make science cool again? Mm-hmm. Was yeah. was kind of like my my career thesis for for a long time. You're trying and to be PR yeah. for science. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's a cooler <laughs> hat in the making too, by the yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. We, someone should make that hat. <laughs> uh, and so yeah, I served for for him for five years directly uh, on set on a bunch of movies and TV shows, and and that was a pretty incredible and demanding experience. And then about three years ago, he placed me in a new position in a new department as the digital creative exec. And so basic at at DreamWorks Studios. So what is DreamWorks gonna do beyond film and TV? What are they doing? What are we gonna do in VR? What are we gonna do in podcasts? What are we gonna do on YouTube and Facebook and Snapchat? And These these conversations are already happening? This was my job three years ago. I was the first one, yeah. Oh wow. It was like a whole new, what do we do in digital? But it's like Mm. Spielberg, you know, what does Steven Spielberg's company do? Oh yeah. Oh fascinating. So they were already looking at all these brand new platforms and like how they're gonna like. Yeah, they were super curious about it. We had a a CEO who was super forward thinking and wanted to, basically this became my argument with with a lot of it, that the average consumer buys four movie tickets a year. And so this is in like the MPAA's 2017 or 2015 Mm. statistics. So instead of being a studio that's trying to make your movie that year one of those four, Mm -hmm. how can you reach people where they are when they're also checking their phone 150 times? Smart. Smart. Yeah. Um, So I think a lot of big studios have been asking that question a little bit. How do they, uh, 
you know, if you're like a film exec and you're focused on film and then you come home and your kids are just talking about YouTubers and you have yeah. no idea who PewDiePie is. and hundred percent. My kids have no idea who's on TV or movies, yeah. but they know all the YouTube stars. Are they scrambling? Are they yeah, freaking they out at this point? Or are hit. they, because it's a big ship. Like we're talking about Hollywood. They're already making billions of dollars. That's a big ship to try to turn. Are they freaking out? Or are they kind of just like, let's tip our, let's put our toe in the water and see what's going on. Um, I think they're freaking out. Oh, I bet they. <laughs> so, what's your yeah. tell me? What do you think? Do you think that uh, we've actually speculated on the show before about like movie theaters? Do you think they're going to be a thing of the past? I think there always will be movie theaters, but uh, you know, Stephen was actually one of the first guys to say it. I think that it will kind of go the way of the playhouse of of like theater or opera, where like. Uh, you know, back in the day, opera and plays were like the destination, right, were right. the thing to go. Um, and now fewer people go for a higher price point. It's mm-hmm. a it's a uh, more mature audience, and it's it's uh, it's a rarefied event that that um, uh, still has this prestige to it. But but um, it won't be the it same. Feels, mass. It, it does. Yeah, it's not like the casual thing. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we we are this mobile first digital first world where we're already paying for Netflix for 12 13 dollars a month now the amount of friction to get you to put on pants go out of the house <laughs> pay for parking arrive at the movie theater at the right time like sit next to your friends get your friends to go get you i mean there's a lot of friction and then you're then you're paying seventeen dollars for a ticket, and then you're also paying for popcorn or hot dogs that aren't that good. Oh Ninety dollars for popcorn and candy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. putting on you, pants is a real and barrier if, for me. And if you're a family, like, and you've got kids, like, you could easily spend sixty dollars for like two hours, or it becomes so easy to just stay at home and mm. and like live on the Netflix and Amazons. Mm. And so, I just think they're super smart, and it's causing the. Uh, studio model that thrived in the 20th century to really rethink uh how they're going to reach audiences and i i mean i think it's a good thing I so what are you good. seeing are yeah. we are you seeing anything that they're that they're doing to make that pivot i i feel a little out of touch because i've been out of it for the last year and a half i unsubscribed from deadline.com and the rap and like all of the all the trades trade magazines so i i, I don't know how what the zeitgeist is feeling right now um, but when you were in it, did you see something that you think that they're going to head in that direction or is it, is nothing moved in that direction since you've left? I mean, what have you seen since then? It's been three years now. Yeah. They were having this discussion is, I, is DreamWorks even on podcasting? I mean, right. are they doing, are they making moves on YouTube? Like, what are they doing? Um, I know they're, well, when I, when I left, uh, my understanding was the position, uh, shut down. Mm. So um, I don't I don't know what they're doing right now. Um, I do know that just generally as an industry, uh, all of the character driven films, all of the the basically creating a movie like the first movie of something, let's say like The Incredibles, that is basically just a pilot. And the best you can do is have seven episodes, and that's Fast and the Furious. Mm-hmm. So, so the the we're in a global world now where you you're making a movie not for an American audience. The domestic market is one out of 150 or so territories, and so you need to think of things from a international marketing perspective. It's now marketing people that are running these studios, not old creative producers or, or directors. And so that's why I think we're seeing more in like the last 10 years, I would say, this change from being this character-driven industry where you would see movies like uh, in the bedroom, let's say, uh, or, you know, house of cards would have been Mm -hmm. a movie 10 years ago. Uh, and now all of that is going from trying to fit a two hour story into a hundred hour story where the writer is King. That's all moving to TV. And, and, and we are just seeing this franchise factory of the superhero movies, you know, that Mm -hmm. that's what works on an international level where you can translate 
super easily. There's no loss of translation of humor in comedy because comedy is cultural. It's mm-hmm. difficult to translate. Uh, action movies do the best. And so the, mm. the, the it's kind of a Makes race sense. to... Uh, race to survive and, and the best way to do that is have this international focus which leads you to the more action and, and Marvel. Yeah, all the, all the good writing is, you know, Netflix, HBO, Prime. Yeah. That's all marketing driven now is the movies. Yeah. That's crazy. So at, what brought you to what you're kind of doing now? Yeah. Was it being in that position and seeing all that? Or? Yeah, exactly. So uh, in this kind of exploratory position. I built all these relationships with YouTube and Facebook and, and Snapchat and, and a lot of their influencers and realized basically that, that these kids that were super successful at social media felt this constant need to keep up with the algorithms and constantly create content in their own digital rat race and were so anxiety riddled and so lonely that I realized, basically, I realized I wasn't the only one that was addicted to my phone. This, again, was about three years ago before it was mainstream that our phones have been designed to be addictive. I I kind of thought at the time that this was my own private shameful problem, that I had these compulsions to overuse and didn't really feel like I was in control of how I spent my time with the constant scrolling and swiping on on dating apps. I thought it was my problem. And as I got to know all these kids who lived successfully on social media, that, that it was even worse for them because they didn't even know what life used to be like before the smartphone. They kind of developed in this hyper stimulated dopamine driven world. And so I kind of realized it was this secret epidemic. And then at the same time I was doing all this VR for my job and being totally blown away by it and realized that Facebook didn't buy Oculus for $4 billion for fun, but to have a stronger stranglehold on the attention economy. And so if me and everybody I know multi-generationally is addicted to our phones with it just being this four inch screen in our hand, it's going to be game over once mass adoption hits and uh, for AR and VR and it's in all of our eyes filtering everything we see and I know that's coming hmm. um, so we all know it's coming uh, we don't know how long but you know could be sooner than we think and and how can we create so with those two things at the same time I realized we needed to create this this ethical balance this boundary with our relationship to technology um, today, there's a term for it, and and we are calling it digital wellness or digital well-being, and uh, but so my my kind of my journey started there, and you know I can talk more about it. But yeah, no, I would, no, it's um, earlier when Adam likened or talked about the book Irresistible and how they compare to coca- to cocaine. I don't think that is a, a good comparison because uh, cocaine is not a necessary part of function in life. Um, now, food is a necessary function part of, of, of life. And we've gone through this processed food, uh, you know, generations now, and we've seen the results of that, because you have to eat. And it's everywhere. And it's cheaper. And it stays a long time in your in your shelf. And it's hyper palatable. Yeah. And so we've seen the results of that. And that's what I compare tech to. It's like that. That's necessary. Like you can't conduct business with it, you know, without it. Oh, I don't think that's true. I think I don't think it's. We feel it's necessary because of what we're doing. But it, you still have a choice. You still have a choice to not use. Tech. Well, my I my mean, point is, it's it's if you want to if you want to conduct business or work for someone, you're going to use tech. Is my point. Tech is going to be. You have to use it. And so what I mean by that is, you have to learn how to manage it. It's not something you can just. Like cocaine, I could be like, I'll never use it again. I, I I think, and I'd love to hear your opinion, Tom. I really think that we're moving, we're heading in this. Uh, have you seen the movie Surrogates? No, I haven't seen uh, it. So that's where I mean, it's the Bruce Willis film, right? That's it's Surrogates, right? Yeah. That's the yeah. Bruce Willis one, um, where everybody is, you know, living in this virtual world, and they've made the virtual world so much like reality, where you can buy things and do mm-hmm. all stuff, and everybody lays back in their chair and they get hooked up, mm-hmm. and you just. You know, and you think the way the movie plays out is like you think that's real life until they they pull the goggles off mm. and you're like, oh shit, he's actually plugged in, and everybody seems to be plugged in. I've made the prediction that we're heading in a in a, a direction where we're going to have a split down the middle. There's going to be 
the plugged in people and then there's going to be the unplugged in people <laughs> yeah. and we chuckle about battle. it but i really believe Sounds that like a good sci-fi movie too. i really believe we're heading in that direction because as, as much as i'm uh pro your movement and what you're trying to do uh, my fear is that a uh, majority of people will not adopt yeah. and a majority of people will, will go with this natural progression. What do you think? Uh, I mean, you're giving me flashes too of uh, H.G. Wells' um, oh, the time, time machine. machine. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. where basically he he zooms like 100,000 years into the future and humanity has diverged into two species and one is like the underground, underground. species mm-hmm. that never sees the light and they're like the smart ones and then you have the <laughs> the above ground beautiful idiots um yeah i mean so basically what we're talking about is whether this technology is going to end up being an all or nothing thing i mean my hope is that we can find balance um or technology i mean we're we're kind of more preaching we're not saying become Amish we're not saying don't use technology. We're not saying social media and technology is bad. We're saying take control of how you use it. Use it in a way that only serves you and, and not you just serving it. And I guess to to respond to uh, the, the first kind of conversation mm-hmm. here, I feel like with kids especially or, or teenagers, their social uh, system lives on social media. And so, uh, it, you know, we people our age and, and higher – uh, can use Facebook, can can use social media. They they could they might get a lot of value out of it, but could take it or leave it. I mean, kids, if you are not on social media, you don't have a social life. That's mm-hmm. where your that's where your invitations and the way that you talk to girls, like it's it's you're basically choosing to not uh, go to the party. Yeah. Um. And so I do think that there's like now this cultural. Uh, aspect to it that does create the feeling like you have to be on it, whether whether you really do or not. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit too, like having a neuroscience background, like as far as the brain development, and, and especially with kids being um, exposed to this so young and how they're going through the process of living with tech now and interacting with it. Like, what what potentially do you see uh, happening as a result of this? Uh well, what we're already seeing, if you if you haven't seen some of the crazy studies, is that teenagers today are, number one, they're safer than they've ever been. Uh, they're not going out and getting their driver's licenses. They're not going out and getting drunk. Um, they are not having sex, and they are lonelier and more anxiety-riddled uh, than ever before. Mm-hmm. And so basically what they've done is, the reason why they're safe is because they're staying at home. And they're they're on Snapchat, and they have replaced their real real world relationships with these relationships through technology. And so the problem with that is that you can only get dopamine through your phone. Uh, what you're missing, and, and that's that's this this endless searching neurochemical where there's no real satiation point. You can kind of never get enough. And so, and it's also the relationships that you form through social media are, are more surface because of that. You can have 5,000 friends or 50,000 followers, but but can you ask them to help you move? How many of those people? I'm gonna Nobody that. wants to do that. Yeah. I'm going to try that. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm going to put it out there the next time. That would be a great experiment. <laughs> yeah, it would yeah. be a great experiment. Yo, I'm moving this weekend. Who wants to help yeah. out? How many Looking people? Cr- crickets. Yeah. <laughs> My lowest yeah. commented and liked post I ever. I do have a piano. So you know. <laughs> that's why yeah. I never bought a truck. Yeah. You own a truck. You're always the guy that's got to help people move. Yeah. So, so what you're doing is, are you trying to help people like, create practices are you you're putting together events, right? That's how it started. Yeah, let's talk about brick. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. So, so basically, um, when I realized those two things, I f- I realized that I needed to solve this problem for myself, and and then could start helping other people for it. So basically, small anecdote: my favorite thing in the world to do is to read. And I have this bookshelf that's that's in my bedroom with like 150 books that I bought over the years in airports mostly. And I'd only read like five of them uh, for a really long time. And I would just sit in bed every night and every morning on my phone, feeling my bookshelf looking down at me. Like <laughs> Shaming you. Condes- <laughs> yeah, that's that sense of shame of basically not doing my favorite thing in the world. Mm. And so when I 
challenged myself to put my phone down for an hour a day specifically to read, at the end of that year, I ended up reading 28 books. And that sense of achievement of taking back control of how I spent my time to do my favorite thing was priceless. Mm. And uh, to to regain regain that kind of agency. And so, and what I know now, kind of on like a neuroscience and behavioral perspective is that's what they call a keystone effect, where you have one behavioral change that creates a cascade of other positive mm-hmm. habits. Um, and so my life really opened up after that. I felt more confident just in the daily world. And, and then when I was back on my phone, I felt more in control of how to spend my time. Does, does this app feel good? Do I really want to be doing this right now? It kind of helped me to get more awareness and ask questions of myself. And so... I started challenging my friends to do the same thing. I got 25 friends, was like, hey, put your phone down and do something engaging in the real world for an hour for seven days. At the end of those seven days, three of my friends ended up deleting their Instagram account. They were like, wow, this is making, like, I don't want this in my life anymore, which wasn't even what I was looking for, but was kind of an interesting find. And then what they also told me was, this is really great, but I wish I could do this with other people. Like, how can I know you know, when someone else is off their phone so we can go on a hike together or something. Mm. And so I started uh, throwing these phone free events. It started beginning of last year, started off as like dinner parties and game nights, basically said, let's all turns our turn our phone into a brick and then do something engaging in the real world. Um, and now how did you market these? Were these pay events or were these just friends coming together? Uh, it was mostly just friends coming together. I mean, uh, we would probably just split the bill at okay. dinner. Um, yeah, game nights were free. Uh, would test a bunch of different things. Sometimes so at this time, charge. are you thinking of the the grandiose vision, or are you just kind of really trying to solve your own problem and, and turn some of your friends in the same direction? Um, at that point, I knew that I... So at that point, I created an LLC. I had okay. wrapped it around this brand called Brick. Basically, turn your phone into a brick, and which means set your phone down, put it in airplane mode or put it into a box, basically turning it into a brick Mm -hmm. and then go do something engaging in the real world. And then our job was to make your brick time or your phone free time super fun and easy and social. Okay. And Mm -hmm. so we were just trying a bunch of things and we're, I mean, we're still trying a bunch of things. Well, I would, I would think it would be kind of challenging without utilizing tech. I mean, how do you, how do you orchestrate that? Right. Yeah. I mean, there is a lot of, a lot of, it's a lot of, uh, texting and creating, you know, events online and getting people to buy tickets and making it look cool and taking photos Mm -hmm. and using Instagram. You know, you use a lot of social media to create a company that doesn't use social media. <laughs> That's gotta be <laughs> so well, this steps so this steps away from uh you know basically like you're still using uh people with smartphones. This isn't like, you know, abandon your smartphone, get a flip phone, get one right. of these dumb phones. Uh, and that's the movement that we're trying to push towards is like going back in time and and just like getting it out of our life. This is more of like, okay, here's how you're gonna be able to manage this and we're gonna take a break. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what we're pushing. We are not saying go get a flip phone. We're not saying uh, let's go into the past. We want to use technology, but we want to use it in a way that makes us feel good and serves us and is a utility. Now, how's the response around this been? Has it been growing? Or right. what, you see? what are you it's seeing? so crazy. Yeah. I mean, I feel like a year ago, everybody was like, oh man, you're going to have people get off your phones? Like, good luck. You're, you're, it's a great idea, man. <laughs> <laughs> and, All condescending. Yeah. <laughs> just like, I, I don't know. All right. And in the last three months, six months, um, we've just continued to go down this path of, of kind of revelations with um, the, the negative effects that the more, like, the more time you spend on your phone, the more likely you are to become depressed. I mean, all these kind of mental health studies are coming out. And uh, similarly, you know, issues with Facebook and privacy and Cambridge Analytica and just like there's, it's just been this constant thing. And I feel like in a really short amount of time, there's been this shifting tide where now people care about getting off their phones. Um, Mm. Digital wellness. So at Wisdom 2.0, which was this conference I was at um, till yesterday, the keynote speaker was Tristan Harris, who was the whistleblower at Google, who basically was saying, we are making, we are the problem. We are creating... uh, uh, dopamine driven, mm-hmm. 
uh, technology that now 2 billion people are using, more people that even believe in, in Christianity are using that's being designed by 50 engineers or 500 engineers that are, are maximizing our weaknesses instead of maximizing our strengths. That, it, that it's, um, so, I mean, there, and, and then after that, I mean, the Q&A was like, you couldn't, not even standing room. It was insane. People yeah. really are interested. The, the reason why I compare this to, to processed food so much is because we, you know, we're trainers, right? So we talk to people all the time about getting fit and healthy and, you know, the number one thing or the top few things you should do when you want to get fit and healthy is, you know, watch your food intake, make sure you don't eat too many calories, watch your macros and get active. But we know that it's almost, it's almost unfair if you're going to eat highly processed foods to try to eat an appropriate amount. They're just designed to hijack mm. your body. It's, it's, you're, you're, you're fighting an unfair fight. You're going to a fight with a knife and you're fighting somebody with a gun. Mm-hmm. Are, is tech that way? Is it like, oh, no problem. I'll just use it and self, you know, regulate. It's not a big deal. Do you think it's so good at hitting those those dopamine circuits and so good at figuring out what gets you addicted that you have to structure a a plan to moderate your use? Because if you try to just rely on, oh, I'll, I'll you know, I'll know when to whatever that you're not you're not going to win that battle. Yeah, I really like the way you just put that. Uh Absolutely, yes. You need to structure your life and your lifestyle in a way that is what we would call digitally well, digital wellness. And, you know, as as to look back, you know, 50 years ago, I just read Shoe Dog, so this is like in the front of my mind, but Great book. 50 years ago, nobody went out of their house and strapped on running shoes and went on a run. Running was like unheard of. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You you just had a more active lifestyle and uh, uh, physical wellness, physical fitness was not something that you had to create to put into your life. Now right. today, you have to. Everybody has their gym membership. Everybody has their practice. That you know, you're running. You wake up early. You you set the alarm earlier to to do your push ups or go on a run, whatever it is. You have to structure that into your life for physical fitness, which is part of your long-term health. Mm-hmm. That's the first pillar of wellness, I say. So then 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 more recently we've had uh this this uh uh movement towards emotional wellness where you have your your mindfulness practices, mm-hmm. you have your meditation apps with the with the, you know, Headspace and Calm being the the top apps of the year. You might have your therapist, which is much less taboo than I feel like it was 10 years ago. So you've got your emotional wellness. Then you have your nutritional wellness where you now have to work hard to eat organic. And if you don't, you, you will eat poorly. You, you specifically are designing your paleo diet or whatever it is. So, so the fourth pillar of digital wellness is creating a healthy relationship with technology. Um, and it's only with all four of those pillars together that you have a wellness lifestyle. Mm. Mm. What I find interesting is that you're getting this increased amount of um, activity and interest in what you're doing. And I think it's because people are starting to recognize it themselves. Like, what's the feedback that you're, are people coming to you being like, yeah, dude, I'm here because I, I know that this is causing issues for me. Yeah, there's two responses. One is like, oh my God, this is amazing. I need this. And the more common one is, oh my God, this is amazing. My girlfriend needs this. Like, <laughs> my, a my, partner. Like, yeah, yeah. And, like uh, a true, like true, true addicts, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, know. but you need to help my friend. Exactly. He's, he's really way over the top. Jesus. He's way well, over the top. You know, I think, Meanwhile, I'm doing it too, you know? Well, I think we <laughs> underestimate people's ability to, to start to self-identify problems. You know, sometimes it takes a generation or two. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I think we underestimate that because, you know, there's movements on the internet. They're called no fap movements. I don't know if you guys yeah. have heard of this. Where, where dudes talk about not masturbating and not watching porn. That did that was 100% created because of the easy access to porn. That didn't exist right. when we were kids. Nobody would have said that. Well, I also think yeah. it's easy to, to tell yourself, too, that you don't have a problem with it when you know somebody who's worse than you are. And so because it's mm-hmm. so uh, it's so predominant in our in our culture right now that everybody, I mean, we're, we're now getting to the point where we, we, we're giving tickets away, right? You can't walk. You can't walk and text across the street anymore. That's And soon we'll be like China where we have uh, a, a texting, texting lane. lane. Yeah, it's getting, it's no getting crazy. I yeah. Mm. No, it's getting crazy. And so I think a lot of people don't think they have a problem because they're not as 
bad as their friend Susie. Right. Or my buddy Justin, he's just, he can't put it yeah. down, right? So they think like- Always throwing me under the bus. Right. Yeah. So I, along those lines, uh, do you have a story or do you have a time like- when you were the worst, like, do you have like a, how, what you, like, what did you streak some, some hours, some days, like how, what, what, what was bad? What was like the um, ultimate? Hmm. Well, first I, I definitely think that this is cultural. Like we are now, we all woke up one day as society and realized we are all addicted to our phones and, and we now, uh, are trying to figure out what to do with it. Mm-hmm. Like, and, and it's kind of like, uh, there's, there's like two great analogies. I think one is the organic movement that we kind of mm-hmm. were, were touching on a little bit. And the other one is, is smoking where, uh, if somebody pulls out a cigarette, you're more likely to pull out a cigarette and smoke. It's like social smoking. You have these like social cues. And so now today, because we know smoking kills and it has all these negative health effects, you have a, uh, a smoker's lounge where you have to leave the dinner, the restaurant, the party, because secondhand smoke uh, has all these negative consequences to go uh, separate yourself. Mm. Um, And so, yeah, I mean, I I feel it's similar with our phones where if you're being fubbed, if someone's using their phones with with you, you feel more likely to, you're more likely to to pick up your phone. 100%. Oh, I've done it. I know I have. Oh, yeah. I've been been somewhere where I see the people that I'm standing next to, they pick it up and I'm like, well, I always have something I need to do on there, right? You look at any restaurant, any any lunch, you know, salad bar, and you've got two people with each other, half of them or more are going to be looking at their phone or at least their phones are going to be sitting on the table. Yeah. It's, that's the norm right now. Mm -hmm. Um, And... I know I'm not really answering your question because no. I don't really have. Yeah, yeah. I, well, <laughs> but I well, to say I'm, that I'm curious to what, like, you know, because again, I think so many people listening right now don't think they have a problem, just like normal addicts that you would meet that have that have a drug yeah, addict. Denial. Problem. Yeah, we're we're in complete step. denial yeah. of that, and so, you know, and and I know Apple came out with their. Screen, screen time. time. Yeah, the screen time thing, which uh, that just reminds me of like tobacco slapping a warning on the side of the cigarettes. They're not really trying to or sell. Like Bud, so, Budweiser, yeah. you know, yeah. anti, you know, drinking commercials. Or yeah. Right, right. They're yeah. not really trying to solve the problem. And shit. That's not like, again, like there's, there. it needs more than just, sure, awareness is maybe the first step, right. but mm. you know, what, what is a lot of time? Like what, what's a lot of time on your phone in the day and what's, uh, what, what, at what point or what are you seeing with these people that are coming to you? Like how bad is it? Are you getting yeah, people statistics? out yeah. there like. yeah so um for sure overuse overconsumption is uh a one specific problem uh uh one one like crazy tidbit if you just spend only two hours a day on your phone over the course of a year that's an entire month of your life so if you're spending the average today is up to 10 hours of screen time on your phone. So if you're on your phone 10 hours a day, 10 hours a day is the is, average? Uh like up to 10 hours Holy a day. Holy cow. Yeah. So if you're on your phone 10 hours a day, that's 5 months out of your life over the course of a year. If you sleep an average of 8 hours a night, that's 3 mo- Oh man. I had this. Carry the two. <laughs> that's 3 months out of the year, right? A third of the 12 divided by no four months out of the year so you're sleep so you sleep four months of a year if five months are spent on your phone that that only leaves three months of each year of your life that you're in the real world so that's but, just crazy that's a very interesting way to look at it and so you know that the number was and this was back when I read irresistible two plus years ago Igen has these stats too in that book. Mm. Uh, it was two hours and 40 minutes is what the average person was. Mm. And that was back then. And I think Yeah, it's, it's so I, much more now. I, I, agree. I think yeah. so, too. Which is so crazy because we're talking about two years ago. Yeah. The growth is exponential. Oh, the, yeah. the amount of use is exponential. It's yeah. insane. I would argue it's probably doubled yeah. since then. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, I, you had mentioned that you had brought up some how studies show that people use their phones more or more depressed or more anxious. Now... I like to look at studies. I like to read studies, but I also like to reverse them at times because sometimes we think one is cause and one is effect, but they might be reversed. Do you think maybe depressed people are just more likely to use their phone or are they finding that the phone, that screen time usage is actually contributing to the issue of depression or anxiety? 
Yeah, that's, I think that's a really good question. I think about that too. I think that probably what's happening is both. You have people that uh, are susceptible. to. So ba- basically our phones have taken all of the historical vices, you, whether it's drinking or smoking or gambling, <clears throat> all of the uh, reasons to to act out in those ways, we can now find in our pockets. So it has become the uh, oh, easiest way sure. to um, distract yourself from an uncomfortable feeling, to uh, like like anxiety in an uncomfortable social social situation, or if you're uh, just had an argument with your partner and you don't know how to solve it, you know you reach out to your phone where otherwise you might have had a drink. You're, you're, the the phone has become this kind of catch all mm. for all uh, coping mechanisms, which once or twice is is not bad, but but if it becomes a habit, it becomes maladaptive. And you end up never working on the problem and solving it, which is addiction. Uh, you know, addiction is is kind of uh, uh, a compulsive, a habit that causes a negative effect in your relationships mm-hmm. or in your career or in your work. And so, so um, there's also a lack of um, of quiet time. Yeah, and this is my girlfriend brings this up all the time. How important it is to have time where you're not doing anything but just being with yourself and thinking, and we never have that. Mm-hmm. And I wonder how big of a role because the big ones, statistic, the statistics for me that are a little bit alarming are the rates of uh, anxiety. Anxiety now, I believe, is the number one psychiatric issue in America and it's exploded like it literally took off yeah and if you looked at the chart it like matches uh the the usage of these types of devices and I wonder if it's just we're so distracted and so have no time to be quiet that that's amplifying that do you wonder if it's also that I mean you brought this up earlier that the, there's just more people also going to therapists and recording and reporting a lot of this stuff too I mean, we didn't have 10 years ago, it was taboo to go see your therapist where now it's almost cool to have a therapist or to meditate for 20 minutes. So are, are some of these numbers skewed because you've got people that are reporting this that we weren't reporting it before? I, I, I think the best evidence would be to look at past research on people who watch TV and consumed a lot of news. Uh, just because it's so new, technology is so new, we have to kind of look back. And I know that for a long time, psychiatrists and psychologists if somebody came to them that a lot of anxiety a lot of stress one of the first things they would say is stop watching the news don't watch a lot of tv and a lot of people notice relief just from doing that and i know that's not exactly the same but uh but we we probably i'm sure during that time we probably went through a lot of this when tv first came out oh yeah right i'm sure we were as as a as a country we were probably freaking out before television I've heard, I've heard a lot of people reference TV as like we were freaking out about TV, but my concern was like I, I've noticed just the distance between like technology plays a massive factor, like just watching my kids, how they interact. And so, you know, I've tried to actually move away from any handheld device to, you know, the TV because it's away from them and they access it. But just having them have access to a phone right here and you see just the screen glowing in their face and they're so into this, you take it away, their behavior is crazy yeah. if you take it away. From well, them. the question then is, it's, and this is where, you know, I, the Elon Musk thing is, I've been tripping on that for fucking the last, whatever yeah, Him it's been. and Neuralink and all this stuff. Yeah. Why, like what, you know, is this our future though? Our are, are we going to be just, uh, instead of uh, being, you know, TV here, you know, can, now we're connected here, soon, not here, it's here. Right. And now it's this, it, that's just the, the natural progression or evolution for us. Uh, and what we're all freaking out about, is the way people connect and do things, well, is it because we're going through this growth phase of this new way of connecting? And is that potentially the future? That, w- that like this is going to be the norm. And that's where I think I still think there's going to be people like you. I think there's going to be people like us who I think I would choose to be unplugged. I really do. Hmm. Uh, I, but I think that for the most part, I think the majority, especially that are that are being born into it. it try telling a, a, and I'd be interested to hear from you, Tommy. Like, I mean, how many 
15 year olds do you have you know how many of these i i, I bet i bet your 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 demographic is probably 25 or 8 ish and up mm. yeah 20 to 35 yeah, is where, yeah. right probably I mean, people who knew what it was like before, before. Yeah, yeah and so they can appreciate they can that recognize but it. like a kid like i mean this blew me away we have a we have a 19 year old that works for us and he tells me a story about, I'm asking him just, I love it. I love picking his brain in here. I'm so, you know, 20 years out from high school. Right. So I like hearing about what's going on in high school with him and what's, what's cool. What's not cool, whatever. And he's like, yeah, house parties aren't really a thing. He goes, that's, it's rare. He goes that they happen. I'm like, wow, that's, we live for that. Every Friday night we are, you're, you're out at somebody's house, you know, uh, illegally drinking beer or whatever. Right. So that was the thing. And he's like, no, that rarely ever happens. And I go, ever? And he's like, yeah, well, every once in a while they are. And I'm like, why? Aren't those the funnest times? He's like, nah, it's whatever. And I go, what? then how do you meet girls? You know, how does that work? And he's like, oh, well, if you're at a party and you had, and there's a house party and imagine 30, 40 people in there doing their thing as high schoolers do. And there's a girl across the room that you're attracted to. And you know, oh, she's in my, you know, third period class or whatever like that. And you're, you're attracted to her. You don't go over and talk to her. The way you, what you do is you actually look her up on Facebook and you friend request her first and it doesn't end there. Like then you're, you're hoping that she opens it up, accepts it. And then you now have the right or the, it's okay for you to message her. Then you message her if, and only if then, and she responds, would you then go over to interact with her? And I just find that fucking crazy, but that is yeah. normal. That's mm-hmm. a, and you would be more weird if you didn't get the permission from her, yeah. and that she's requested your friend request, and you just walked over to her, touched her on the shoulder, and said, "Hey, I think you're beautiful," or yeah. start a conversation with her. You would be the outcast. Yeah. So how do you break through to that generation that they need to disconnect from this when it, it is now already become a part of them? And that's the part that I wonder of movements like what you're doing and what I what I think we need. Uh, and what will happen is I, I wonder if we're just going to divide people in half that some of us are going to agree with you. And then the other half are going to say, you're crazy. This is a part of me. Yeah. Well, I do think what you're describing with Neuralink and having the internet in our eyes is the future. Uh, and it's kind of like right now we're in, so in the industrial revolution, everybody's lives sucked. Like they were, they were covered with soot and mm. coal and like coughing, like lung cancer. Like everybody was suffering, uh, that lived during the day was suffering of building all these factories in the revolution. Today, our lives are awesome because we are reaping the rewards of an industrialized nation. We are currently in a new digital revolution where the technology in the future with AI and Neuralink type stuff is going to be awesome. And, and uh, we are just suffering the consequences because we haven't built up our ethics and our boundaries with technology to mm. catch up with it yet. And that's, that's what you're talking that's a, about. That's a very so. interesting way to look at it. That's cool. Yeah, yeah and like that's that. what you're talking about. You're talking about creating practices mm-hmm. for yeah. people and teaching them how to create practices. Well, yeah, remember, I'm not saying how don't use your phone. I'm not saying like live live uh, without it. I'm saying like this stuff is coming. Let's use it in a way that, that like I'm, I use social media. I, I would, you know, I would use dating apps. Like I, that that is a part of life. I wanna I want to enjoy that and use that. I just don't want it to be taking advantage of me. Mm. Yeah. What are some of the practices that mm. you that you teach at these events? Or you guys talk about. You talked about the one hour <clears throat> phone off, make it a break, do something engaging. Is there are there any other practices? Yeah. So um, we have this thing called brick mode auto reply, which is an auto reply for iMessage. So. Right now with our always on world, one of the reasons why we don't put our phone down, one of the reasons why we don't take vacations is because we feel like when we're off our phone, that that feeling of when we come back to our phone, we get this notification flood and the guilt of of having not responded to someone fast Mm -hmm. enough or having yeah, also having missed on something. So so when you put on this auto reply, which is like an out of office, which email has had forever. Uh, you it relieves you of that pressure because anybody that reaches out to you knows that you haven't seen it yet. You're not ignoring them, and that you'll get back to them when you're back on the phone. That's back smart. on your phone, and so that's like five steps. It's kind of a hack of do not disturb while driving. Um, 
It's on our website. That's a super great way to just um, live for a few hours off your phone without any of that kind of subliminal twinge of guilt or or friction that makes you not want to do it. So you can do mm. that right now? There's a way yeah. to do that right now? Yeah. Oh, wow. And you said it's kind of a hack. It's a five-step. Yeah, my client, yeah. I just found this out literally like two days ago. A, a good client friend of mine was messaging me back and forth. And like I got back to her like two hours later and I got an auto reply that she was driving. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was like, what? My I didn't friends even know that. had that. Yeah. I, I didn't know that existed. So that, that has been on phones for a couple of years and we're <laughs> using that technology that. to change that message. So you can set that up manually. So it's not just when you're driving, it's whenever you don't want to be on your phone. What we change that to is, hey, I'm in brick mode. I'm not on my phone right now. I'm off the grid enjoying life. I'll get back to you when I'm back. Uh, very phone. cool. Yeah. And so you then knew, oh, like she hasn't seen this yet. It also, we feel like we get up, we get upset with people when they don't reply quickly. It's kind of this two way street in this always on culture we're in right now. And so, uh, uh, you know, it relieves, relieves. I just had this with my, my two best friends. We're, we're all on a thread together and they just happen to be talking politics and baseball. Baseball is my least favorite sport. And I, I don't like talking politics that often. And so I just hadn't re- not a reply. I, I well, no, I hadn't responded, but it was just, but it was just in a day's time, and it was just funny to see them. Like, hey, everything they asked me the next day. Hey, Adam, everything okay with you? <laughs> yeah. Are you all right? And I'm like, no, nah, yeah. just busy doing other things and everything like that. Like it was, and the topic you guys did addressing, like I just didn't care to get involved mm-hmm. in it, just to get involved in it. So it's funny how we've created this culture now where we expect people to do that. I had the same thing with Katrina. I had. Uh, I had, was on my way to God. Where was I at? I was on my way somewhere to meet somebody, and what ended up happening was I just got caught up talking to them for like two hours. And when I when I interact with somebody like we are right now, like I get rid of my phone. Like I've definitely uh, began to make that practice already and notice a difference when I, as soon as I get in a setting like this where I'm t- especially people I may I don't know very well or I'm meeting them to talk to them in person. I put it away, and she got really upset at me because I didn't. Uh, it, I ended up dragging on for like two and a half hours. And, you know, as soon as I got out, I called her and let her know. She's like, why didn't you tell me you were going to be that long? I said, I, said, I didn't know. I didn't know. And then I, I got to talking and then we got caught up in this this deep conversation. And it was really, it was all positive. It was all good. I was telling her this. And she's like, oh, I wish you would have just texted me. And I'm like, yeah, I just, no, <laughs> no, I wouldn't. I don't want to have my phone on me and realize like, oh, you've been talking for 45 minutes. Hold on. You know, let me text right. my, let me text my wife here and yeah. just let her know that I'm going to be home for another five hours or whatever. It's like, come on, dude. So maybe that. Brick mode auto reply could have saved totally you. right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, I love yeah, that. So. I, I love that. I think that's a I think that's a great idea. There are more are there more practices? Yeah. So um, you have the the daily hour that we preach to collect at least one hour brick time a day. Uh, we actually have this five step uh, challenge, five step digital wellness challenge um, that is a great kind of one new step a day way to to establish a healthier relationship with your phone and technology. Um, The first step is to turn on screen time, Apple's screen time feature, if you don't have it on already, and look at your data just to get baseline. So just have an awareness of how long you are spending on your phone. Whatever it is, whether it is one hour or 10 hours, uh, just knowing that kind of sets your bar and then you want to the second half to that is to release the shame you have associated with it to basically realize that our phones are designed to be addictive and they are constantly uh battling each other for our attention and so it's not a surprise that that and the smartest people in the world are doing it, by the way, to try to get our attention. That's why Facebook and Google and Amazon and Apple are literally like the five uh, most profitable businesses in the world. They've done a really great job capturing our attention. And so it's not it's not your fault that you are now spending a lot of time on your phone. So it's it's turning on screen time, getting a sense of your your baseline, and then releasing the shame. That's That's step one. Step two is now that it's on, looking at which apps on your phone you're using intentionally and which you're using unintentionally. So like, for instance, Google Maps, nobody wastes their time on Google Maps. You (laughs) put your destination in the phone and you use it as a utility. The moment you're there, you shut it off. No one's been like, 
No yeah. one's wished they spent less time right. on or Google Or Uber Maps. would be another good example. Yeah, of that. Uber. Right. Uber, exactly. Um, uh, unless you strike up a great conversation with your driver. I don't know. <laughs> Has that ever happened? <laughs> no, 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 I don't know. Unless you lost I had your a flat earth conversation. That was fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and, then, and then you have, you know, typically social media apps or the apps that kind of have the, have the bottomless feed. They're, they're much more likely for you to get lost in. You know, you might reach out to your phone to check the weather. But then 45 minutes has gone by and you realize that you just watched five videos on YouTube and now you believe in the flat earth theory. So, so <laughs> it happens guys. So, um, it, so, so which apps do you use intentionally versus unintentionally? Uh, I just gave you a couple clues for, for like what's typical and then also which apps are you using and then you're feeling worse after using them. Hmm. So so like Instagram, if you go on there and you look at all these beautiful people connected to you with all these awesome filters on it. And then now I feel fat. Yeah, exactly. I, off, I feel less about myself. Yeah. yeah. The, the, Cause Insta- just common. Instagram is, it's a very common one. And Instagram can be used very intentionally. Like if you want to go on to get good information or learn from people, but most people don't, don't you most, most of the time people spend on there are not to do that. It's, it's the perfect example where it's just a tool. Like it can be used for, for good. Like, like uh, a lot of people are finding out about Brick, you know, through Instagram specifically. That's actually the platform that we use more than anything. But then at the same time, especially with young people and especially with young women, uh, biologically, uh, we have a tendency to compare. And and it's basically comparing fitness. Back in the day, you used to compare yourself to like the hottest girl in your high school. And maybe you would see like 17 magazine or something in the supermarket. But now you're not just comparing yourself and comparing your fitness with people in the local, the local realm. You literally have the entire world of all of the most beautiful people, plus the Photoshopping element. I mean, it is the most impossible of impossible standards mm-hmm. at this. And, and in addition to that, um, you're comparing your inner reality to their outer highlight reel and so you actually have no idea how happy they are or if they actually well, not look to, like that not to mention it completely skews the real your, your perspective too like it completely makes you think that that's more common than what it really is yeah. i mean you you follow if you follow there's only about ten thousand super super fit people on instagram you know they're all and we're all following the same ten thousand, <laughs> yeah. you know and they're spread out all over the world mm-hmm. but because they're in your feed every single day five days a week looks like a norm yeah, yeah. You're a norm and i use the analogy to people who, who that don't realize this is go walk into your local gym right yeah. i used to say this as a trainer i used to when people were, would be telling me about a magazine like i'd get clients to come in and say oh i want to look like this adam mm-hmm. yeah and then I said, you, are you sure you really want to put the work in discipline to look like that? Or you just want to be healthy and better fit? And then I would stand them up and I say, look around in my gym. And I said, find me, find me five bodies that you would like to look like. And they couldn't. It's like, cause most people in there are, are working towards getting in better shape. And there's a little bit of a self-selection bias. These are people going to a gym, right. don't even use the gym, right. just look in real True. world. Right. Yeah. And you're not going to find it. We, we evolved to compare ourselves to the people around us. We evolved in tribes. And our brain doesn't know that we're not living in right. tribes anymore. And so now you're on Instagram and global tribe. Yeah. It, it, you know, I use the analogy of uh, how many, how often have you ever seen someone who's seven feet tall Basketball in real players, life? Yeah. You right. never see, I've never in yeah. my life have I ever seen anybody who's seven foot tall except for when I went to an NBA game. Mm-hmm. That's the only time. So if I've never seen basketball players, I would not know that people who are seven feet tall existed. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing with, the super small waist, big butt, fake boob, you know, whatever people on Instagram. Didn't one of you guys just post that there's like a one in 88,000 chance oh, yeah, of dating a supermodel yeah, yeah, or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 My so, answer. so we have a tendency to compare and that's natural. And that's an example where Instagram maximizes our weakness, where um, we're susceptible to that. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that step two is uh, kind of in, in like a, a little innocuous way, helping you kind of pay more attention to that. Um, step three is uh, turn your phone into a brick for an hour a day and do something engaging in the real world. We challenge you to choose something that is meaningful to you or some, something that you love to do and something that you can do every day. So like skydiving is not as good of an example as like going on a hike or watching the sunset or something. 
That's step three. Step four is moving that brick hour to the morning. So the first hour of your day mm. becomes phone free. Uh, now, this, why is that? Well, that's probably why is the that most so challenging. Yeah. Oh, so I so this my one of my like biggest issues I think um, that I that I was struggling with was exactly that. Where first thing you wake up, you grab it. Yeah, first thing I wake up, I would check my phone in the middle of the night. Um, this kind of. Uh, God, imagine how much that's fucking your sleep up. Oh, with the blue light, with the, the, even if you don't even respond to the emails, just reading that or seeing that your brain can't help but start to grind its gears. And, uh, you're pretty much guaranteeing to lose an hour of sleep when you do that. But, but I mean, so that's the worst case scenario, but what's predominant and much more common. And we now, uh, through people that have filled out our, uh, is brick for you survey on our website, we've had like 2000 people do it. Uh, I think like 70% of people check their phone first thing when they wake up. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's pretty common now. And what you're doing is you're coming out of the dream state when you are, uh, most suggestible. And also you are, are basically, uh, you know, trying to set an intention for your day. You know, what is your day going to look like? If you go straight to a phone that puts you in a very reactionary state where you're suddenly, uh, needing to respond to other people's requests of you, to the emails or the agenda, instead of setting your own agenda, and also collecting and integrating, um, you know, what came up for you overnight, you know, through your dreams and through through the kind of, you know, wherever we go. And so when I moved my brick time to the morning and spent the first 20 minutes meditating and then showering and making coffee and then checking my phone, I mean, it totally changes changed my day and uh i mean that i could not recommend you know more. tommy in exercise mm. uh we call what you do before you work out priming um and if you treat it mm. if you treat it properly you will have a much better workout by priming your body properly to do squats or deadlifts or whatever it only makes perfect sense that you're going to come out of an extremely parasympathetic state where you're basically unconscious recover recuperating uh, and then you wake up and the first thing you do is prime your brain for these short dopamine hits. Right, all this input. That's only going to make it much worse later on. So what you're saying makes absolute perfect sense. That priming your brain first thing in the morning with your phone is probably not a good idea. I love that. I'm going to use that at priming your brain yeah. for how you want to spend your day. Exactly. That's really cool. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully it sells more tickets for you. <laughs> <laughs> I got gotcha. you. What's, what's the next one? Um then step five is uh, whenever you are with other people, that should be brick time. So we argue that phone time should be solo time because the moment you're on your phone and you're with other people, you're not really with them. Mm. You're in Instagram land or you're in email land. And uh, uh, there's also studies about it that show that having your phone uh, on you or visible uh, makes for less meaningful uh, connections. Less mean- it's called the iPhone effect, um, which is similar to another study that shows that just having your phone on you actually reduces your IQ by 10 points. <laughs> I think uh, uh, just the kind of baseline distractibility that you have that I've personally noticed, which I feel like I totally agree with you, where you were saying like, like my phone's not on me. I just, it allows me to be more present and be mm. engaged and not kind of wonder like, Oh, what time is it? Or, or feel like, the vibration in I, your pocket. Oh, totally. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm even worse than that. I don't even need to, my phone is on do not disturb all day, every day. And I still check my phone wow. <laughs> constantly. I don't need any external stimulus anymore. It's, I've been programmed, you know, my own internal, uh, programming and dopamine drivers are, are. Well, I also good. find too, like just, the critical thinking aspect, like being away from it. It's like, I feel like that part of my brain somehow gets like atrophy because I'm so, it's so accessible all the time. Like I did have Google answer everything for me all the time. Yeah. And for me to sit back and to, you know, really analyze uh, what somebody has told me or, uh, you know, how I'm going to deal with a situation. Like I need that time to process. You know, for people hearing what Justin's saying right now and who are thinking, oh, that's not really what's, here's your example right now. Think of five people that you talk to on a regular basis and tell me their phone numbers. You can't. You don't remember anybody's fucking phone number anymore. Yeah. Now, when we were kids, I could tell you 
my aunt's phone numbers, right. all my aunt's phone I numbers. I still parents, can tell you phone numbers friends. from my childhood, yeah. but I couldn't tell you the people that are five closest to me now. Yeah. Right, because we've ex- we've uh, basically um, you know outsourced that to our technology, and what Justin's talking about is starting to happen. We're outsourcing all of this critical thinking and abstract thought and whatever to our phones. I think the la- that last step that you said when you're with people – that you don't have your phone on you or you make it a break. I personally, I think that's the most impactful one mm. that I, that I think would be the most impactful. I haven't tried any of these steps yet, but I feel like that's the most impactful one. Like when you're with people just, Oh, that's it off the phone, turn it off and then just be with those people. Now, have you, have I, you, I agree. have you started to create any sort of like parameters or even like a, a graph to give people like, like I'm curious right now, like, man, I wonder if I started to do putting my phone on brick every time that I put it down and put it away from me. I have no idea what what it would a- amount to in a day. So, do you have like these like what's really bad and what's really good and where everybody kind of is and what what we should strive to be? Do you have any parameters like that? Uh, well, we are developing an app that will allow you to track your brick time, okay, and kind of gamify it. So cool. you can see how much brick you know if you're collecting your daily streak of at least an hour a day, how many days in a row you have at least. Very smart. Um, so you could build we, like a house or a wall with your bricks or something. Yeah, a brick road. <laughs> yeah. Path to a new. Oh, hey. uh, path hey. to new. Follow the uh, yellow brick road. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's like, like that. what our billboard could be. It's a bunch of phones <laughs> on the ground. As Brilliant. The brick. Oh yeah. my god. Uh, that. Um. So, so where you can track your phone time, did you, did you collect more phone free time this week versus last week? Right. I think that it's similar to like physical fitness apps like Strava, you know, or, you know, if you're familiar or, or mm-hmm. where even just the 10,000 steps, yeah. I think that, um, you know, there might be, uh, aspects uh, of a leaderboard or an ability to see how you're doing versus your friends and kind of an aspect of a positive reinforcement through peer pressure. Um, so that's something that we're working on. Yeah. Um, Ever feel conflicted developing an app that has like the open loop theory and trying to attract people to utilize it while you're also tra- <laughs> <laughs> like, I, do you yeah, feel conflicted? Con- I don't. Right? Do you feel a little conflicted a little bit? I don't feel conflicted at all. I feel like it's it's kind of like me, part of what I'm trying to preach where we're not saying the phones are bad. Right. We're mm-hmm. not saying that apps are bad. We're saying that technology we're using the same techniques that are currently being used against us yeah. with the endless scroll with the red notifications that boost the dopamine response we're using the same uh competitive and social drivers for habits but for positive habit change right. mm-hmm. to get you to spend more time in it's the good real way world to look at it look yes. it, look technology is a tool it's no different than if i put a hammer on the table and i said is that a good or a, is this hammer good or bad well if i swing it at you and hit in your head then it can be bad. If I use it to build something, then it's good. Technology is uh, is incredible. It's an incredibly powerful tool. It's all in how we wield it. And I like the term that you use. What do you call it? Digital wellness? Yeah. I think that's absolutely brilliant because um, I think you're right. I think it's something that we're going to have to wrap our, our arms around and really start to manage and develop practices around it because it didn't exist yeah. 20 or 30 years ago. We didn't have to have practices around technology like we are going to have to have today. So walk me through what this would look like. If I, I mean, you, we've got people that are listening right now that are, are, you know, you have one half that are probably in denial. You have the other half that are like, okay, <laughs> I need this in my life. Um, or, one half wants it for their girlfriend. The other yeah, half yeah, wants ex- it for themselves. yes, yes, exactly. Right. So, so for the girlfriends out there, right? Uh, what are the steps that you that you would tell someone to do to get involved in what you're doing? I mean, the easiest thing is just to sign up and join the crew on our website. Uh, so if I join the crew, what does that mean? I'm part of the I'm part of the click. Uh, then you bump. then you uh, get the brick challenge. Okay. So you get an email that says, "Hey, you know, it's kind of explaining our mission. Okay. This is what we're about. This is what it means to turn your phone into a brick. We challenge you to turn your phone into a brick each day. And then if you're in LA, you'll get our invites to come to our phone free events. So. Uh, we, yeah, I guess I didn't really talk about this that much, Mm-mm. but so beginning of last year, we started throwing dinner parties and game nights, and then it kind of grew into takeovers of big venues, typically with a focus of wellness. So mm. we took over this huge co-working spaces movie theater in Hollywood and did a holotropic breathwork experience phone free. 
Uh, we took over a meditation studio a week before it opened and had 70 members come in and do a free meditation class. And then, then they were able to, you know, get a discount on the membership. And so, and then this year, uh, we're doing quarterly retreats. So phone free weekend getaways, typically for people who are super successful at social media, but have then felt this obligation to be on it all the time and keep up with the algorithms. We provide a structure for them all to get together and connect, reconnect with themselves and others more meaningfully in the real world, in the natural world off their phones. And so our weekends are like fully programmed wellness weekends with like yoga and meditation and hikes by wilderness survival experts and uh, we've got like impossible meats is going to do a meatless taco night, which I don't know if they've done before. And so, so we bring health and wellness brands to the table as well to say, Hey, we have this influential young demographic of people who care about getting off their phones and who are very rarely fully present. This is an opportunity for you to engage as an athleisure brand or as an outdoors brand with these people that, that, uh, are interested in this. So. And the, and you're saying the response has been growing pretty. Like when I talked to you on the phone before we did the podcast, you were saying how it's kind of this exponential response. Yeah, it, it's crazy. I mean, we uh, th- that's I think what I was saying in the last three months. I feel like people really have started to care about finding the structure for phone life balance for mm-hmm. themselves. You're gonna have to. You're gonna. Ha- I know we we were comparing it to TV earlier, but here's the difference. Like TV. Can't TV, carry it TV's pocket. like caffeine. <laughs> TV's like caffeine. Tech is like crystal meth. I mean, they're both stimulants and they're both kind of addictive, but TV had limited bandwidth. Um, you know, you had one or two in the house, maybe three max. It wasn't in your pocket. There were, it was very limited what you could look at, what you couldn't look at. It couldn't change instantly. Like if I'm watching a TV channel, I have to kind of watch commercials and, okay, I change a few channels. With, with tech, it's like boom, 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 boom. And it's very fast, very fast feedback. Um, and it's personalized to you. It so is. Yeah. You, you are seeing specifically what the smartest algorithms in the world know you will respond, which will make you most aroused. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I, respond to. I think, I, and look, I, I see this with my kids. I have to develop a structure with my kids around food and activity. Okay. That's not, there's nothing uh, crazy about that. A lot of people do that. But I also have to put a structure around tech with them to teach them skills to manage their relationship with technology. Because if I just let it's, them go, it'd be no different than having just all the candy and processed food and shitty food in the house available to the kids and allowing them to govern themselves. They would never develop the skills. They just can't. It, it, the human body did never evolved in an environment this way. It's just not fair. And I feel like if you count on your because I've done this. I'm a very, I consider myself very self-aware, right? All of us, we're all fitness guys. And so we're all like, okay, we're very self-aware. And I've tried to self-regulate with technology without practices. Doesn't work. I've had to develop like, I'm, like one rule in my house now that I've started to do is the only time I can look at my phone, my phone has to be plugged in. And so it's in one central area. And so if I want to check it, I got to walk over. And if I didn't do that one practice right there, that one practice has helped me significantly. Mm. But you, I think you have to start to you're, you're going to have to start to create these practices, and um, it's a growing market. We're seeing it now with you're doing these retreats, but we see it in like obstacle course racing and all, you know all these other kind of getaways and stuff that weren't really that popular before. I think people are starting to feel it. Oh, know? that's a that's a great one to talk about is OCRs because it's just like it's exactly like that. Absolutely. Who would ever thought that people would pay tons of money? To go beat themselves up yeah. and climb uh, climb under barbed wire fences mm. in the mud and do all this stuff Get like that bloody and muddy. But we, we, you know, there is this. We all have this in us. Like it's this, you know, animal instinct to want to feel, to want to do these things. And we've been so plugged into the tech that there's opened up an opportunity for somebody to create Joe DeSena, to create Spartan and this massive yeah. movement. And it's continuing to grow because we need it. Yeah, and we're all. I mean, all we want is connection. That's why we reach out to our phones, to social media. We're trying to see if we got a new like or a new follower. We're, that, that's that's what is driving us towards it. The problem is, is that those aren't meaningful connections, and so we are we are so lacking in these meaningful connections and this sense of like tribalism. You know, we are we are 
uh, we have evolved to to live in in work in groups and create human bonds. And so that is why things like this are starting to exist and why people are responding so well to these mm. phone free experiences because we we don't do anything in the real world unless there's a structure for it now. Nobody just goes out to play. Right. Like kids don't just like go throw a ball anymore. Yeah, you don't go walk to your neighbor's no, house you, three doors open and knock on his door. You and need say, to specifically structure it yeah, into yeah. your life. Yeah, you have play dates. You know, yeah. when I was I a hate kid, that term. But yeah, yes. you have to you have to schedule play dates. The thing that worries me most is and again I keep going back to 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 the way people eat. And that's just because that's the the, the field that I've worked in for so long. But I know when people eat hyper palatable, high sugar, salt, fat type foods that are processed, after a while, you actually, your brain becomes wired towards those things. So then when you go eat a strawberry, it tastes bland. You eat food that's natural and it just doesn't taste good because you've been, your brain is now being conditioned. And what I notice is when you go off those, those other foods for, for a long time, then you go back and eat a strawberry and all of a sudden it tastes delicious again. My fear with tech is that we're, our brains are getting wired to respond to these quick dopamine hits so much that there's going to be a serious withdrawal. Like you unplug and shit's not going to be normal boring. It's going to be depressing boring. It's going to be like quiet and oh, what do I do now? And That's my fear of the kids. Like when you say that, that's why I brought up the, the point about the, the generation that's, is it too late? You know, did they have they already made it such a part of their life for so many years that you try and pull away from them and they're going to spiral Dude, out of control? Ask any parent. I'll, I guarantee Justin will agree with me. When my kids are on their 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 phones or on their computers, and they've been on for an hour or two hours straight, and I take them off, it takes them about an hour to get back to normal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we all suffer. I mean, the withdrawal is real, and and that's that's what our retreats I think tackle so well that people come out of them they go through the withdrawal however mm-hmm. long that lasts a couple hours uh they're not kids so so maybe it's different but i, I don't i don't really think it is i think we're all in it it would be, it would be interesting to see if you're attracting the people that really need it or more people like your like yourself or like ourselves i need it I'm doing this because I need it myself. <laughs> I need it more than anybody. Well, you didn't tell me how bad you got. I wanted to hear a fucking bender. Don't be, don't be shy if you went on a fucking <laughs> nine-day cocaine bender and never came out of your room type of deal. Did you ever... I mean, when did you really tell yourself like, holy shit, this is a major problem? Did you have a moment where... I mean, are there kids right now that don't leave their room for two days straight? Like, Does that exist? Absolutely, yeah. It does? Yeah. Wow, yeah. that's fucking crazy. I noticed with myself, it was, um, I've been working out consistently since I was 14 and my workouts have always been my place of solace, you know, meditation, if you will, I'm alone, I'm in my zone. And I noticed the problem when it, it completely infiltrated my workouts in between sets, I was on my phone and taking selfies and I, I unplugged, I mean, you Helpies. would too, you know, yeah. <laughs> I unplugged from my workouts and I got back to my old like feeling from them and I was like, holy shit, man. It, it it totally if it, if it infiltrated something that I've always respected and valued and loved, gosh, it's got to be like that with everyone. I tell people now when I coach them, like turn off your tech when you work out, right. listen to music, but don't go on your. Well, phone. I'm all for the you know that 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 automated response for driving because I've noticed and and I've always prided myself as a really good driver and very you know very aware and like. Uh, you know, present in, in my driving. And I've just noticed over the years, like, just like, I'm so distracted, so constantly distracted. And I, I didn't really attribute it to my phone. I just knew that I listen to podcasts. I, I commute every day here to work for like an hour or so a day. And, um, I just realized, and it, it, it's funny because I got in a fight with, with my wife about this a bit because she started saying, you're starting to drive like an old man. Like you're swerving, like you're, you're off the road a little bit. And like, I was just getting mad about it. I'm like, no, I'm a good driver. Like I don't get in accidents. Like, the, but I, I'm realizing like, I, I am, my mind is in other places, but I'm constantly like looking down where my phone is. And like, I got a text message just hit me. Um, you know, things are just always on and, I I'm gonna start implementing that practice. I, I'm yeah. convinced it's it's from that. Let me know how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> what what kind of feedback are you getting from people who are t- attending your events and uh, applying, you know, your steps and practices? Uh, there's one guy who said that he can never remember anybody's name, and it's just something he's had a problem with since he could re- remember. And he came out of that retreat 
uh, remembering 52 other people's names and he didn't even try. And he was so surprised at himself. He was like giddy that he effortlessly remembered everybody else's name. And it was because he was just fully present. He was engaged and he was connecting with these new people that everybody was basically a stranger when they when at the beginning of the weekend and came out of it like best friends. It was so crazy. But people are saying that that they felt like they were more themselves than they had ever been. Uh, at least in recent memory, so it's super cool. Mm. Do you do you from a from a you know neuroscience background? Um, what are some of the fears uh, that you have surrounding this? We talked about dopamine, but you know, with your background and with you with the way people are using this tech, are, are there any fears from that perspective? Yeah, I mean, we are to use the food analogy. We are eating donuts, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We are constantly uh, getting, we are constantly feeding that dopamine response through our phones. And it creates this <clears throat> this low-grade uh, distractibility and the need for a fix. That's why people, that's why I would wake up in the middle of the night for no reason mm-hmm. except to check nothing nothing there's no reason how many times do you do you reach for your phone when you just put your phone back in your pocket like there's no like we are doing these things out of habit and so um that's that i don't want to say that we're all addicted but those are uh, those are our uh, addiction like you know those are habits that are not serving us and so the the goal is to and this is i feel like the conversation to have with kids where don't lock up the cookie jar and set it aside because the moment you get the cookie jar, you then like want to want to binge it. Yeah. Um, it's really more um, having the donut, but having it only for dessert. Being able to structure it so you have your your your. Maybe I shouldn't have used that analogy at the same time. Those are kind of two different points. But. Well, no, or your workout, you could use it like that where it's like you've you've earned that time for you to utilize this tool. And so you're learning to integrate it within your life is what you're saying. Yeah, we're not saying, yeah, exactly. We're not saying don't do it. Just right. don't have it right when you wake up or don't have it constantly throughout the day. I mean, it, it is the unstimulated mind that is the most creative mind that allows you to integrate. The, and The irony is too that you, you'll find yourself way more productive on these apps that you quote unquote feel you need or you have to do. And I'll use an example like Instagram because that is an app that we use a lot because we're on that platform. And we've recently uh, grown to the point where it's now impossible for me to respond to everybody. Like we just, we, there's uh, too many DMs and emails every single day that even if I stayed on all day long, I just can't, I can't get to all of them. So, but one of the things that we all pride ourselves on is our engagement with our audience and trying to respond to as many questions as possible. And so, uh, you know, what do I do? It's gotten so overwhelming. And so there's always right now there's just messages coming in. So how do I handle this when I actually follow this structure? And I'm not 100 percent on this. There's days I do and there's many days I don't where I tell myself, OK, I'm going to allot myself 30 minutes sometime in the morning. So sometime before 10 or 11 a.m. where I'm going to sit down and for straight 30 minutes, I'm going to answer as many questions as I can get through. And then I'll do it at the end of my day one time. The irony is I actually get way more of the work actually done. I respond to more people than if I allow myself to just check it all frequently all day long and try and respond to a few for a few respond to a few. I actually get more work done in the smaller amount of time because it's very focused on what I need to do and get out of there versus getting caught up, you know, scrolling up and down and checking somebody else's Instagram and what they're doing or a distractive booty pick or whatever that makes me hang a left, you know, and then I go down the rabbit hole. So there is something to be said about, you know, people are probably, some people might be freaking out that, oh God, I got to put my phone down and I can't be on it, that I won't be able to do this. You know, I know there's people like us who use these tools for their business, social media business, your emails, your website, all these things. Well, I've found personally that when I structure it and I follow the structure that I've laid out for myself, I actually get a lot more fucking done and then then allowing myself to use it all day long anyways. Yeah, you're just using it you're using it more intentionally. Right. You're creating a specific intention, a, a purpose for using your phone and you don't stray from it. If you grab your phone without an intention, it's much easier to find yourself using it unintentionally 
And you're also kind of doing what, you know, the Pomodoro method where you, you do a specific task for 25 minutes and then you give yourself a short break. Hmm. And so that is a really nice way for like focus and productivity. So you're like, okay, for 25 minutes, you can do anything. So I'm just going to do this one thing and uh, then give myself a treat, a reward of a break after it. Mm, interesting. Now, you, you were talking about the app. How long until that's ready for use? Uh, we're going to do our first uh, beta test for a small number of people, hopefully in about a month. Okay. Okay. Um, and we are also developing a physical product um, that I'm excited to share more about. But basically, it... Uh, is a physical box that will allow you to collect your brick time mm. and kind of has the 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 central concept that uh, out of sight, out of mind uh, is, is one of the uh, key components to uh, actually doing the phone free behavior. Now, how how the hell do you make money? I mean, you're you have a neuroscience background. You come from Duke University. I'm sure there's a, plenty of jobs that you could have done that pay you very well. I can't imagine this being very profitable uh, to build. How the fuck are you supporting yourself? Um, I'm not yet. <laughs> uh. So are you, did you come here in like a minivan and you're living in the back of it right now? Or what's, uh... No, I, uh, yeah, I'm basically just been living on my savings from uh, my last job and uh, got a little lucky and bought some cryptocurrency kind of early. And I've kind of just been building the business off of that. Uh, the 2018 was community building and kind of testing the value proposition and the message, which, uh, we now, ha I now have a lot of confidence in 2019 is going to be making more revenue so that I can survive. I'll move back into my parents' <laughs> house. <laughs> yeah. Good. Well, I um, think, I but think yeah, a lot of ways we're, we're testing right now for that. So I think you're, you're tapping into a movement. That's um, already building and happening. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, what, it's going to grow. Yeah, if you don't do it, someone else will. It's my personal opinion. Yeah, no. And and so separately from Brick, uh, the reason why I was at Wisdom 2.0 is because I'm involved in this group called the Digital Wellness Collective. So it's 90 other people like me who have devoted their careers to digital wellness, to solving this problem, whether it's with apps that block you from from social media or it's therapists or researchers or authors that are writing about this all working together as a membership based organization to support each other with like peer mentorship and events to then make this a true bona fide industry and rise the whole raise the whole tide mm. so um we had a booth there and you know that's that's um the grassroots organization that is um trying to support and give a voice to to all these people like I th me. I think the smartest thing you did was uh calling it wellness um because you have you guys have you gone yet to like health and wellness conventions that are not tech that are just about health and wellness because if you haven't that's probably a great place for you guys to go. This was the first conference I've ever been to for this stuff. I've kind of been building in the dark a little bit. I almost like didn't even go it was like on thursday that i was like okay everyone else in the leadership team is going i have to go um but yeah i would love recommendations on yeah because I could, I could see the wellness uh sphere i mean we're talking to you about yeah. it um i could see the wellness sphere really adopting this as part of um you know their mantra which includes the ones that you listed which i thought was also brilliant you talked about food exercise you know activity and now digital wellness. I think that's a very, very smart strategy. Has this all just been centralized around the LA area or have you gotten a good response, you know, throughout the country? I, so I'm based in LA and I'm trying to, uh, I feel like LA is the perfect city for it. Everyone's so oh, yeah. image focused and has their dream. They're trying to, you know, they're all trying to become successful on Instagram. And, and uh, so I think it's the perfect place to help people find a balance. I want to make it work there first. Uh, it's also just where I have the strongest network. Mm -hmm. uh, we have thrown events in New York and San Francisco, um, but what it will probably be as we expand to it specifically for Brick is uh, like a, an ambassador program where anybody can throw a Brick event, anybody can put together a phone free experience, invite their friends, whatever it is, whether we are going to go to a concert or we're going to have a game night or something, and everybody knows and opts in to, hey, we're not going to be our on our phones during this time. Let's just like have a fucking good time 
And yeah. So well, good deal, cool, man. man. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, wish you all the luck in the world. Thanks I think so I think you are grabbing on to a trend that's growing. So I mm-hmm. think if you do everything right, you guys are going to do very well. It really feels opinion. like it. Yeah. yeah really enjoying it too. Wouldn't want to be doing anything else. Awesome, man. Well, thanks for coming cool. on the show, brother. Yeah. yeah. Thank Appreciate you so it. much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.